Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, June business meeting of the Board of Education. Uh, the board met in executive session at 6 p.m. to discuss the superintendent's evaluation and contract. And um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. And please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag's at the back of the room. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Announcement since both most of you are at the back of the room and uh, have uniforms on and are far more fit than we are In case of emergency just go right out that back door. There's a second uh, Exit up here at the front uh, on your right side um, And we have a, we have a lot of students here tonight and we and we love that and I'll say this to just for the students We understand that there may still be some work to be done to finish this year out and uh, we're not offended is as um, we move from that portion of the meeting where you are presented, um, if you leave, uh, if you leave quietly, that would be even a bonus for us. But um, <laughs> go finish that homework and study for those last exams. Um, could I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Jim, second. Janet, all those in favor? The agenda is adopted, and we'll move on to uh, Board of Education comments. Mr. I Turner? have no report tonight. Okay. Um, I just want to say that we had the part high school partnership team meeting yesterday, and it was the last meeting of the year um, where we did a summary of what we have accomplished for the year and some thoughts about how we proceed next year. And I did want to thank all the seniors in the um, senior graduating class who took the opportunity to um, complete the exit survey. Um, and one of the comments we had somebody write something quite lengthy and then said, but I know you're, nobody's reading this, and then put his email or her email address. So it was my intent to email them and say, but yes, we do. <laughs> so I just wanted you guys to know that they are being read, and certainly they guide um, how we proceed moving forward in um, next year's goals document. So and that's it. Thank you, Jan. Gary? Uh, just maybe a little bit of update. Uh, one, uh, you know, you uh, yourselves, we ourselves, passed uh, a couple of resolutions, uh, the last board meeting to go to the state uh, board association convention. And it, there is another one that is, is being prepared or has been prepared, but it's going through BOCES. Now, it actually, several years ago, was a resolution that came from this district. But it's different, and what it what it involves is tuition for the blind and the deaf schools. Uh, normally, when a special education student moves with their parents to a new district of residence, the uh, costs associated with educating that student passes to the new district of residence. With the blind and deaf schools, the way the law is set up right now. The district that originally sent the person to the school retains responsibility for the costs of sending that student, even though the student moves to a new district. So a number of years ago, uh, the state board agreed that, association agreed that this was not consistent and that it should be changed. So we talked about having to be consistent and to have the cost follow the, the student and his family to the new district. However, there's a little bit of an anomaly there, and that is that the blind and deaf schools obviously have to be located someplace. They happen to be in certain school districts. And sometimes the students would be relocated, and then the family would follow to be with their kids. And so these, t these districts were incurring, an un they would incur, a disproportionate impact as a consequence of the change that was proposed. And as a consequence, despite the fact that, you know, there were several organizations advocating the change, including the state education department 
and the former deputy uh, commissioner for special education, uh, it got no traction. So it has been, has been rewritten. It's going through the BOCES board because they represent a broad spectrum of districts. And of course, if, if BOCES is known for uh, any services, it's special education services as well as career and technical. Obviously, they do a lot more, but that's what people are generally are aware of. So I felt that perhaps it was a better idea to go this way. And what the proposal is, the solution is that the, that the state assume the responsibility for the tuition. Uh, you know, it's not easy for any district to, to absorb fifty to eighty thousand dollars a year for the cost of one student. Uh, it's tough enough for Shenandoah, but a Northville that is on the verge of bankruptcy and so forth, with uh, maybe a three or four million dollar total budget, that's a disaster. And so there's really justification for shifting the responsibility of, of paying for the tuition to the state rather than the district retaining it. Um, that, that would be the main thing. And I hope that you all, I know Dr. Robinson said something out. I also sent it out. The Education Conference Board uh, material relative to uh, renewal of the tax cap. Every, everybody agrees that the tax cap has pretty been very fairly successful in curtailing expenditures, but there are negative sides to that when you no longer have the ability to raise the revenues that you need to provide the services and programs in our districts that are definitely suffering more than others as a consequence of their limitations and in, uh, to their ability to raise uh, funds. So uh, they're trying to have some kind of an adjustment. And of course, you know, the passage of the initial legislation was hinged on the idea that there would be sort of a quid pro quo. That is, there would be a end to unfunded mandates in return for the, the tax cap. And of course, the tax cap was passed and nothing was really done with the unfunded mandates. The last, the last specific thing that I really wanted to mention, again, is really has a, a BOCES school district implication. And that is that there is pro the proposal that uh, an additional allowance be made or uh, provision in the tax cap legislation to provide for capital expenditures that are incurred by BOCES for its buildings and equipment would be, which are all passed back to their constituent districts, would be treated the same way as other ta capital expenditures. That is, it would be outside the, the cap. Because right now what happens is it gets passed back to the district. It is not outside the cap. And as a consequence, the constituent districts have a hard time saying, yeah, go ahead and do that. And the end result is that the students who go to, to the uh, career and technical programs and so forth don't always have the best equipment and so forth that they should have in order to prepare them for careers and so forth. So that, that would be a provision that we, you know, both I think we and the BOCES should be able to uh, support and, and endorse. Great, thank you, Gary. Gary uh, uh, is our expert on legislation and on um, what's out there and what's being proposed. And the, and, the, and the beauty of Gary doing that is, as you heard tonight, Gary not only is a defender of uh, and, and keeps track of things from the Shen District side, but also is fully aware of the impact, uh, especially on a lot of the, the smaller districts or the, or the, the city school districts, which are um, really struggling with, with these mandates. So just to, we appreciate that, Gary. It, it is that time of the year where we're, there's a lot of awards or a lot of, a lot of things going on. I just wanted to mention um, several, several things. Um, a couple of us were at the dedication the other day of the new art, uh, art gallery at the high school. Um, that's been a long time in planning. I, I really appreciate the fact that the uh, high school folks invited uh, Mrs. Battistoni back, uh, who had been, she claims she's been advocating for this since 1991. And uh, by a generous gift of the class of 2014, uh, among others, uh, the, we have an art gallery right in the, um, right in the lobby over there. Um, uh, Fran made a wonderful comment. She said that she wanted to thank a person. I don't know the name. I don't know, Janet, if you remember the name. It was like Joe Blow. Why did she want to thank Joe Blow? Because Joe Blow invented the cell phone. 
and we're still wondering, okay, what's the connection with the art gallery? Well, the art gallery is, is in the place where all the, um, the phone booths at the high school used to be. <laughs> and if it weren't for the invention of the, of the cell phone, then there would be no place for the art gallery. So she, she tied it all together. It was a beautiful story, and, and the kids were very proud of what they had. There's a lot of work in there. The art uh, club is going to take responsibility for uh, recirculating um, the art and bringing in new art, and uh, it can ha handle multimedia space. It's, it's just, it's a beautiful space. It was great to be there. We walked outside. We dedicated a stone to um, a, actually um, one of the um, classmates from the uh, class of 2014, Hunter Cronin, who uh, was involved in a fatal accident on the way to school last year, and they dedicated a stone in the memorial garden out front. That was a, a very moving experience. And you know, you do those things sometimes, and you wonder what the impact is. The impact was the grandparents were there. And for them, it was just, I, I think it was a very sweet reminder of their, of their son or grandson and and uh, so you I, I think it's just so appropriate that we do those things we recognize not only great performances but we we recognize losses as well we've been through a number of award ceremonies um, at the high school level from ninth grade then the upperclassmen and then finally the seniors um, just there's a lot going on there I, I was asked to make um, announcement there are two uh, special events recognizing seniors in our district uh, at the uh, uh, Shenandoah Baccalaureate Service at Christ Community Churches. The churches get together and try to do something uh, uh, together to, to uh, celebrate uh, the graduates and uh, St. Edward's uh, Church is having a, 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 a parish senior mass on Tuesday, uh, June 23rd. The baccalaureate uh, at Christ Community Church is going to be Wednesday, June 17th at 7 p.m. Um, and I also am, um, need to apologize uh, that um, I should call out. We have uh, three board members who are not um, here tonight right now. I think one may be joining us. Todd Gilbert um, has had er earlier in the year had surgery on his knee and he had uh, uh, additional surgery the other day and um, he's home dealing with swelling and pain. So um, um, he sends his regards. Bob Presley, um, our vice president, is out of town on business and uh, Mary Blabor is at the Dollar for Scholars Award um, night tonight, and I think we'll be, she was at our executive session, I think we'll be joining us again. And Christina Rajat, who was uh, elected to the board um, in, the, in the May balloting, um, will be formally uh, joining the board at our organizational meeting the first Tuesday in July, but um, is here as an observer to start getting your feet wet on these matters, so welcome, Christina. Thank you. Uh, those are the comments I have. This is a time we move to public comments. I look especially forward tonight to the uh, introductions that we're going to have from the students. I think we have um, our, our students, as they're coming forward, and they're bringing, I think, their, their replacements as well. Um, I will mention the um, uh, and invite any residents who wish to speak. This is an opportunity, as soon as the students finish, for you to address the Board of Education. Um, we will ask your name and address to confirm your residency within the district and to use uh, that information event uh, follow-up as necessary. The board will not address specific comments. We remind uh, residents that the public comment portion of our meeting is only one item on a long agenda. We therefore ask each speaker to be as succinct as possible and the remarks be limited to two to three minutes. We'd also expect the residents to speak in a respectful and courteous manner so as to model proper civility and decorum for our students and we commit to doing the same. And the residents may also contact the board via email at boe at shenat.org. All questions come into the superintendent's office are shared with the board. Policy questions and concerns are typically answered by the board president. Operational questions and concerns are typically addressed by the superintendent. Welcome, ladies. Hi, thank you. Um, Taylor and I are very honored to have had the opportunity to come to all these meetings this year to speak on behalf of the Senate. And we are very excited to present our new reps to the Board of Ed, and I would I'd like to ask you guys to come introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Sarah Diacetis. I will be a senior next year, and I think I can speak for both Alex and I when I say we're really excited uh, to be part of this group next year and be representing the Senate. Um, my name is Alexander Rakowski. Uh, you guys can call me Alex, of course. <laughs> and um, like Sarah said, I'm very excited to be part of the board and hoping for a very good, nice year next year. Great. Perfect. Great. Thank well, you. Welcome. And thank, and thank you, too.
there anything we should know at the end of the year? Be safe. <laughs> yeah, that's our job. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any residents who would like to speak, address the board? If not, we'll move into the superintendent's report. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Casey. A couple of things just to point out to the board's attention. You have invitation to the graduation. I'm certainly looking forward to that. On the 25th, um, the Green Pass is the pass for you to, to get in the, the rear of the parking area. Um, also, I, I, in your packet were the board meeting dates, and just bring it to the attention because one of the things that we'll be asking the board tonight is to actually approve the meeting dates uh, for next year, recognizing that if something were to occur that we need to change the dates, we can certainly change it, but we need to have the, the meeting dates because these dates impact many other things um, that happen throughout the school district as well. And the second piece to bring to your attention, I'm sure Mr. Casey will be doing some follow-up, is preparing for the board retreat. We have the two dates, August 4th and August 25th, um, both prior to board meeting dates to do the board retreat. So a copy, a sample copy of that agenda uh, was also placed in, in your board packet. So again, um, certainly relay your thoughts to Mr. Casey and I'll try to organize things from a operational side for, for the district as well. Um, and just, just a, 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 a general thank you to the board for attendance at many, many events. I know that I'm out at a lot of events and, and there's always a board member here. So, so, you know, it's not one of those things you say, oh, woe is me. You know, woe is all of us. We're out at many, many events and, and I think the students and staff appreciate it. And I want to say thank you very much thank as a you. board for doing it because this is that time of the year where it is truly the rat race where you're going from one thing to another thing all the time. Uh, but it's worth it in the end because this is where we see the fruits of our labor um, come to, 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 to a head um, this time of the school year. So, so I want to thank you for that as well. So if we can get a plug in there. Um, I was I got, <laughs> looking at this is great. We're both members of the, uh, of the board of the Shenandoah yes. Education Foundation. Uh, we annually have a uh, gala of our largest fundraising event of the year. It is this Saturday night at the Hilton Garden Inn. Starts at 6.30. Uh, we recognize this year, we're recognizing a distinguished alumni. We've been doing that for the last uh, three or four years. And um, tickets are still available. Um, and uh, we've had, Mrs. Gray has been uh, coordinating uh, auction items and she's uh, been driving herself crazy doing it, but just done a wonderful job. So we've got all these, all these great prizes. We just need people to come in and bid. And if and you can't come to the event, you can go to the shenedfoundation.org and click on it, and we will accept online bids via email. For the auction. For the auction items. Yeah. There you go. For it. And there's some great prizes. Yeah. Good. If she says so herself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of help. Sure. The ten, yeah, we move into tenure. Yeah. Sure. Um, as Mrs. Bush comes forward, uh, we're always pleased to bring yeah. candidates for tenure to the Board of Education. And certainly, I'm sure Mr. Casey was said um, later on in terms of the seriousness of the process. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a complete vetting of the candidates. And, and tonight, we have some um, wonderful administrators to, to bring forth. And, and certainly, I'm pleased to present Mrs. Bush, who will present those candidates. Thank you. Um, good evening. We do have three candidates, administrative candidates tonight being recommended for tenure. And the first one is Mrs. Rose Beckett. She's the assistant principal at Coda Middle School and her tenure rec was written by Mr. Sean Natt and he apologizes he was not able to uh, be here this evening. Um, but Mrs. Gowries is here representing the middle schools and, and the support of Rose. So uh, what Mr. Um, Nat wrote about Mrs. Beckett is that she's an outstanding middle school assistant principal. She's always willing to, to do whatever it takes to help her students at CODA to reach success. She's been very innovative with the OVEUS program, which is an anti-bullying program that has been brought to the middle school. And he also included some comments from teachers, students, and parents. And uh, one of them was, thanks for being you. Thanks for always being available to meet with us. And I just want to thank you for your dedication to your work. So many, many things in the recommendation for Ms. Beckett in her first administrative role as, as assistant principal at CODA. Um, our next person recommended for tenure, and then we will ask you to come up at some point, is Mrs. Rachel Stead. Um, Rachel is the academic administrator for 
um, languages other than English. English as a new language or second language or ESOL, whatever. <laughs> it's been called many, many things. And she's also responsible for some of our administration of grants. In the tenure recommendation written by Dr. Elizabeth Wood, she writes about Rachel. She's a deep thinker who finds ways to inspire both teachers and administrators to work in the best interest of students and is committed to the continuous improvement of the Shenandoah School District. In addition, um, Rachel has been instrumental in leading the uh, Superintendents Conference Day that we had recently in planning for diversity workshops and a presentation um, along with Lisa Kissinger for our entire administration. That's Rachel Stead. And our third administrator being recommended for tenure tonight is Ms. Kathleen Strangis. Kathleen is being recommended as the academic administrator for literacy, ELA, and social studies K-5. She has, uh, she is, not has, she is a dynamic, innovative leader committed to the continuous improvement of the Shenandoah School District. Her tenure was also um, written by Dr. Elizabeth Wood as her supervisor, and Mrs. Strangis has been um, very innovative and instrumental in leading the uh, implementation of the Journeys reading series, and work, she works with our literacy teachers and does many, many good things. So it's my honor to actually recommend these three um, administrators for tenure this evening. Thank you. And Jill, I think these are part of the approval of the staffing recommendations, which are later in the meeting. But as I, I know to my right, we have a tenured, uh, a person who had tenure as a teacher. And I bet Gary would like to make a motion to uh, that we accept the recommendations and grant tenure to these three people. Absolutely. I would like to. Janet, second? Absolutely. All those in favor? Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Please come forward. We also want to thank their families. If you are here this evening for the uh, many hours that they've given to the Shenandoah School District. So we move on to um, information items, and um, is Mr. Cullen here? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did see him right there. Um, yes, come Mr. On. Cullen, oh, come oh. forward. This is uh, a tradition we have had for years now. Um, twice a year, we recognize different athletic teams um, for their tremendous accomplishments, and it's always a full <coughs> house. And I'm pleased to turn over to Mr. Cullen. You're going to do both, correct? That's the unified that? sports as well? Yep, okay. yep, they'll be last. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Robinson, the Board of Education. Uh, it's always a great honor for us in the athletic program to be able to come up and um, uh, present the student athletes who have accomplished such great things uh, throughout the course of this season, which is the spring season. Um, I do want to thank Janet Gray, who I know is uh, re retiring from the Board of Education. Um, and in the time that I've been the athletic director, Janet's been a great supporter for us in the athletic program. She's had two outstanding athletes who came through the program. Uh, and just on behalf of all the athletes and coaches at Shenandoah, we thank you for your service to the board and thanks for uh, all the support you've given us in athletics. It's been, it's been, a tre it's been tremendous. Um, just to give everybody perspective for the year, we've had over 1,400 student athletes, again, participate in the Shen Athletic Program. Um, we're very proud of the fact that 23 of our 29 teams have finished either first or second uh, in the section, which is, to be honest with you, it's pretty unheard of. Um, we've had state champions, regional champions, sectional champions. Uh, some of our track runners that are going, are going to be coming up here today will be going for the state championship this weekend. Um, and one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, how hard our coaches, how hard our teachers push our student athletes to be true student athletes. And I know it was mentioned at the last board meeting, I was informed of this, but just to reiterate, it's the seventh straight season where uh, all of our teams have, have qualified with a 90 or better average. Um, and it's, it's seven straight seasons in two straight years where Shenandoah will receive the highest recognition for student athletes, uh, that we will be a school of distinction by the New York State Public High School Athletic Association. So a nice round of applause for our athletes. Who, uh, 
they not only get it done on the field, on the track, but they also get it done in the classroom as well. Um, the first team that we would like to bring up here is a team that hasn't been up here in a few years. Uh, they're under the first, they're under a first year coach. Uh, we made a transition from Coach Damboys to Coach Farquharson this year. Um, this team had a great season. They wound up winning the Suburban Council North Division. They had the number two seed going into sectionals. They were rained out a week, two weeks ago Wednesday, I think it was. We had really bad weather. They were rained out on Wednesday. They came back on Thursday. They beat South Colony 1-0. Uh, they turned around less than 24 hours later, beat Shaker 7-0 to win the Section 2 championship. And to win two games at that level with that type of competition is a very, very <coughs> difficult thing to do. Um, they had a tough loss out in regionals out in Syracuse. Played well. Uh, but the one thing you need to know about this team, they have two seniors on the team. So there's a good chance that you might see them, uh, you might see them again here, but no pressure. You know? so, so I'd like to call Coach Farquharson and the uh, girls softball team up here. So. I want to thank uh, the Board of Education for having us and acknowledging uh, just the, the scholar athletes, uh, as um, Mr. Coleman talked about. Uh, not only are they impressive on the field if you've come to see us play, but also in the classroom with a 95 average for an entire team. That's pretty impressive. Um, you're looking at a great bunch of girls, uh, most of them returning. We have two seniors, Amber Kelly and Alyssa Garrison, uh, who will be going on to college next year. Uh, Alyssa will be heading off to Oneana to play softball there, and Amber will be going to Herkimer to play uh, softball there as well. So it's pretty impressive that they're going to continue their careers uh, after uh, high school. Um, I just really want to talk about um, the team, how athletic the girls are, how, how well they competed, um, finishing 21-3, and three, uh, competing, uh, just something Co uh, Mr. Cullen talked about was uh, just defensively how well we played in the sectionals. Uh, we didn't allow one run. Um, and won the sectional in three games, less than 24 hours, and uh, the fight that these girls bring to the field and represent Shen with a great amount of pride. I just couldn't be prouder to be their coach. Good job. Good job. Um, next up, we have our uh, we have our girls outdoor track and field team. Uh, they're no stranger to being here, both as indoor athletes and uh, outdoor athletes. Um, this is the third straight year they won sectionals. Um, I believe they scored 183. Um, I, I believe they scored 183 points. Saratoga, their arch rival, scored 163. Those two teams combined for more than half the entire points that are available in a sectional track meet. And when there's 14 other teams there, that's a, that's a pretty impressive honor. Um, they had a great season overall. We have 16 athletes or 14 or 18. 18 athletes that are headed to the state championships this week down at, uh, down at UAlbany. So the girls outdoor track and field team and head coach Rob Cloutier and uh, Keith Jordan. So come on through, girls. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm a three-sport head coach, so eventually I'll get used to being up here and put my communication degree to use, but not tonight. So, um, Chris gave you a little overview. I'd like to say something inspirational, but we're, we're simply just going to keep it to um, some statistics because in my eight years of coaching track uh, on the girls' side, this is 
the team that has eclipsed anything we've ever done in eight years. Um, we've had some really good teams through the years as well. So he said, he told you that 181 points are the most points scored ever. I don't know if he mentioned that the prom was the night before. <laughs> now, with that being said, we knew as coaches on Wednesday when the meet was originally scheduled that there was no chance that anybody was going to beat us. We knew we had, these guys were ready to go. We had seniors that had to readjust and, and make different plans. Um, I have a lot of respect for, for how they went about that. They, they made compromises. They knew that their decisions would affect not only themselves but their teammates. And they came out and did a, did a wonderful job on Sunday. Um, simply, they're the uh, Suburban Council champions. They're the Eddie Meat champions, Suburban Council Junior Varsity champions, Section 2 champions. That's three in a row, five of the last seven years. Um, Chris mentioned they, that we've qualified 18 girls to the state meet, and every single one has a legit shot at being on the podium, which is pretty exciting for this weekend. Um, it's the first time any team in Section 2 history has swept all three relays. We had two girls have outstanding days that I wanted to highlight. Um, one is not here. She's a freshman sprinter, Alexandra Tudor, scored 26 and a half points. So she scored in all four events that she competed in. And Sarah Knowles, who is here competing at Villanova next year, a senior, scored 18 and a half points and ran four races after dancing at the prom. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, so by far, very, very proud of this group. They accomplished anything and everything that you could possibly accomplish and left Saratoga really wanting, uh, uh, having a bad taste in their mouth. So we're pretty excited about what they did. Thank you. Uh, I do want to mention, and Rob, I want to pick up on the theme that Rob mentioned. I had it in my notes. I figured he might mention it. I do want to tell you a little bit about dedication. Um, and our meet was supposed to be run. We were the host school. Our meet was supposed to be run on Wednesday for the track championships. The way it's staggered with all the other divisions, they run Wednesday through Saturday. Um, when the meet was canceled, the only opportunity for us to run was on Sunday. Um, I also knew that was the day after the prom. Um, the one thing that I, I, I want you to know is that on both the boys and girls side, even after going and delivering that message that, hey, this is your prom night, we have these track championships the next day, every single boy and girl student athlete who was scheduled to compete showed up to compete on time for their event. And I think that speaks to the dedication and that's the culture that we have within our uh, athletic program. And that's part of the reason why we have the success we have. So that's a testament to their desire to compete. Um, the last team that we'd like to bring up, this is our second year in unified sports. Um, I think the program is more successful than ever. Uh, last year we piloted this program as one of 12 teams in New York State. Um, this program has expanded across the state. It's now out in Section 3 and Section 8, uh, which is out in uh, Syracuse, and it's moving down to Long Island. Um, we receive a tremendous amount of support, as Michelle here, we see, receive a tremendous amount of support from Michelle Mylod, um, who takes care of helping us get the aides organized for the program and has her academic administrators make sure that we have the support in place for the students who have um, certain needs. Um, we have five partner, uh, we have 12 athletes, we have five partners, uh, those are students who help out. Uh, the other students on the team, and we have five kids in our uh, Youth Activation Committee, which you'll hear from Rob Weeks. Um, the team defeated Gilderland to win the championship in their bracket at Skidmore, and I think Dr. Robinson would agree that it was, a, it was an outstanding event put on by the Public High School Athletic Association, um, and they did a tremendous job. So I do want to call up Coach Galarno, Coach Weeks, and our members of our unified sports team. Come on up. Uh, I'm Rob Weeks. I'm the 
yak advisor, I guess I'd be called, and I should uh, segue my speech by saying I don't do much other than get this group put together and Coach Galarno does everything with them. So I have a lot of these guys in school in my phys ed class, so it's, a, it's definitely a treat for me to be able to get these guys into a setting like the Unified Sports Program. Uh, we're hoping to uh, increase the participation and the uh, hopefully a couple more sports in the next couple of years, but this was our second year at Unified Sports. Uh, I am responsible for putting together advisors uh, for our Youth Activation Committee, and, and we chose, uh, you might know some of these guys, uh, Danny DiGennaro, Dietrich Cartman, Anthony Danalo, Kevin Gardino, and Kiernan Kaufman. They did a great job throughout the season, number one, advocating for the team, uh, letting everybody know when our games were, and they were also responsible for fundraising, and they raised over $400 for Special Olympics, and they will be doing a fundraiser at Five Guys on Thursday, a couple days from now. So if you don't have any dinner plans, <laughs> you go to Five Guys, you buy a burger, proceeds go to Special Olympics as well. So that's my involvement in it. I enjoy it. Uh, it's definitely one of my more enjoyable uh, coaching avenues. So I'm going to turn it over to Coach Galarno. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the, the Board of Education for your support, Dr. Robinson, Mr. Coleman. Rob does more than he gives himself credit for, but um, everybody, it's, it's a group effort in the support and enthusiasm and the energy that goes behind this program. Also to the parents, thank you so, so much for your dedication to your kids, uh, for being at the games, for enth your enthusiasm and your support as well. And I think they, they know and, and hopefully they're thanking you for your support because it's much appreciated. So. This season was great. Um, it, it was everything that we that we hoped for. It was uh, it progressed from last year. More kids, more skill challenge players, uh, more athletes, more partners. And um, I know a lot of you were able to to come to the games, and it's truly it's inspirational. I don't know how else to say it. Um, I got emotional last year up here, and I'll try my best not to get emotional uh, now. But it's it's just it's amazing the the growth that we see from these players, not just on the court but off the court, the friendships, the leadership, the interactions, it's, it's second to none, it's, it's truly amazing. So I feel proud that I, I, I have the opportunity to coach these guys and girls. Um, thank you to the managers that have helped out throughout the season. Michelle, thank you for your support. The aides, thank you so much for all of your help on the bus especially, to and from. Um, it's, it's truly appreciated, thank you very much. So. And last, last thing, a, a word to all of the athletes Never forget to work hard, believe in yourselves, and don't let anybody ever tell you you can't do something. Believe in yourself, have a good attitude, and that's really what life is all about, so thank you. They're leaving before. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> right out the back door. Um, the only other thing I would like to add is that uh, I do want to thank Dr. Robinson. Um, we played up at Skidmore. Uh, we got up at 8.30 in the morning. We went up there. We were in the early bracket because we did have kids going to the prom that evening. And Dr. Robinson took time out of his day to go up. He handed out the medals and the championship plaques to not only the players from Shenandoah, but the players from all the schools. And it just kind of shows, again, back to that reason why we're successful, everybody's commitment to the program. So, again, I want to thank the Board of Education for all their support and everything they've always done for us to help make our program successful. And uh, we'll see you in the fall for football, right? That's <laughs> next time. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Just just a comment for whomever's here. Um, the board does this for, for sports um, during the two seasons, but the board also attend um, every award banquet. And quite frankly, we, we couldn't put the 900 kids that we honor for academics in the library. And that's why I want to thank the board for it, because at each one of those, we have multiple board members. Um, however, something that, that I'm going to throw out is not necessarily my idea. I'm going to give credit where credit is due 
to Ms. Deficiani that, and we, we thought about it, I thought about it a couple of times of even trying to acknowledge some of our drama kids to have them come and be recognized here um, because it's a tremendous venue for our students to be recognized. And, and so when we could bring them to us, mm -hmm. we could try to bring them. And when we can't, we go and, and be a part of their respective ceremonies. And this is just a, a wonderful way to, to remind all of us that, um, especially this unified group, this is why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you're making us all very nervous <laughs> because while we were in executive session and you were outside the room, at the very end, we talked about how to, how to recognize. And we, we were talking about the drama kids yep. particularly. What, what groups can we provide that kind of recognition to? So we're on the same page as you are. Good minds. We look forward to doing this. Yeah. And speaking of good minds, um, we're very fortunate that this community has been very supportive of us um, through the budget process. And each year, we take the time, credit to Mrs. Deficiani, um, of collecting and analyzing the, the budget survey data. And we use this as actually in many different ways. We use it to gauge some sense of, of the, where the community is going in terms of who is more involved in, in the process or not. But also, while you won't see tonight, um, we even look at sometimes some of the comments that people have to certain questions, recognizing that there's certain comments that we just simply don't read because <clears throat> Um, it would create more emotional roller coasters than not. But there's certain questions we look for, for feedback on because questions in terms of direction, program, um, focus, things of that nature that we can either use to validate or confirm or otherwise the direction we're going um, with this piece of it. So this exit poll data is just more than just an exercise. In other words, we truly want to truly use this from year to year. And the second piece, and I'm not sure if Keller's going to mention this, um, if you saw the, the Onboard magazine this, this, this week, um, in fact, I got my version today. Um, there's an article about the, the statewide reduction in voters. Since um, in the past four years, the reduction in voters statewide on school budget has re um, dropped by 28%, almost 400,000 people less statewide um, voting on school budgets, which is kind of shocking when you think about the, the tremendous attention that schools have received, um, particularly over the past couple of years. And, and we're seeing that too. Keller would point it out in terms of some of our data trends. So our data very much mirror what's happening statewide. And I don't have an answer to, to, to that. I'm not sure if it's because people are more content with their schools or because of people just the whole idea of voting and politics um, have made people so, I don't know, uh, I, I couldn't tell you what's the reason why, so I'm not going to try to 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 fathom one. Um, but I was surprised when I saw the data in the on board that because we were concerned that our numbers were so low. But when I saw that, I realized, wow, this is happening everywhere. I mean, to my almost 30% drop in voter um, in in four years, that's that's significant. So Mrs. DeFashana is going to walk us through some of the highlights from the exit poll uh, as we move forward. Thanks. Um, actually, and what Dr. Robinson just mentioned is when I first started here, they always talked, everybody talked about the 2000 threshold, and you may yeah. even remember that. The, two th the 2000 threshold was that you are always, the district always has 2000 no voters. So we always knew we had to get out, you know, more than that to have a past budget. This is the first time in the 20 years I've been here that we actually broke the 1000 mark. Um, we were under 1,000 no voters, and that's pretty significant. So um, as far as the survey goes, um, participation was up this year. I think it may be um, we tried to move the surveys where the surveys were located the last two years, and I think people just didn't, they walked past it. So I think that may be a reason why we're up a little bit. Um, last year we did have the glitch with um, paper ballots getting tossed out at the end of the night. But this year we had 120 paper ballots, so I don't think there was that many last year that Just would have affected clarify, this. Surveys. Survey. Survey. survey, not ballots. Oh, I'm sorry. Survey. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. Survey. <laughs> yeah. Survey. Yeah. Paper yeah. surveys. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, last and year. There's no chance. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I. Yeah. 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 Survey. Surveys Survey. were thrown out. Exit polls were thrown out um, after 2 p.m. I collect them at 2 every year. Um, and the ones after that, the custodians thought 
I was done with and threw them out. So I, we're thinking probably about 50 got thrown out last year. So the participation rate still would have been pretty low, but I think coming back to the, the original location helped with that a lot, so we're, we're back up. Um, more yes voters completed the exit poll, and that's pretty typical. A lot of times people think no voters fill it out because they want to tell us what they think, but actually yes voters are more likely to fill it out. And among um, people without children, 74% voted yes. So um, even when people don't have kids in school, we're seeing that a lot of them are voting yes. The majority of people um, found that the maintaining the quality of education is the most important reason for voting. Um, the interesting thing to me is that people seem to be focused more on efforts to control spending than the tax rate. So if you show that as a board you're um, you know, looking to save money in different places and stuff, it seems like people respond to that. And among the people without children, voters um, said the most important is educational quality, which is also interesting. Even when you don't have kids in school, they recognize that um, education quality benefits them as well. Okay. Sorry. Um, how would you rate the quality of education at Shen? Um, if you look at between excellent and good, it's been pretty consistent, 92 to 94% over the years have rated us um, excellent to good. Um, we saw, you know, we're seeing kind of a, a trend where more excellent people, the, the excellent um, numbers are going up a little bit, so that's good. And among people without children vote, um, voters, the majority ranked the district excellent, 57%. So, um, you know, we have a good reputation out there, which is good too. As far as do you think the Board of Education and the district administration are leading the district in the right direction? Again, 71% said yes to most of the time. And that we've had a low of 66% and a high of 76%, so that's pretty much right in the middle. We did see a little bit of a trend, a little bit of an increase in the um, people who said no. That could be due to a contested board election. Sometimes you see things change a little bit when there's disagreement as far as that goes. Um, among the no voters, the majority said no and most of the time, which is kind of what you would expect. Do you think Shen school taxes are too high? Or are, I mean, <laughs> most people, the majority said reasonable. Um, again, no voters, the majority said too high, but um, among people without children, the voters, the majority said reasonable. So, um, you know, they don't, the people, even when they don't have children, seem to think the taxes are reasonable. Are you willing to pay more than the maximum allowable tax levy? And again, this has been pretty consistent with people saying yes, um, no voters say no, um, but even uh, among people without children, the majority said yes. What level of importance do you place on the following areas? What? What you said, Mr. I, I was saying it kind of demonstrates consistently how difficult it would be to get an override okay. on the cap. Yeah, 60%. No right. place does it go over 60%. Yeah, we've, I don't think we've ever hit 60, yeah. Close, but we're not there, yeah. Um, the majority of the people uh, rank high quality staff as the most important um, area. And then next is rigorous and relevant um, curriculum. What's interesting is if you look down at the bottom, the ones that are ranked a little bit lower, a lot of those look like they're growing in rank. And I think if you remember that first year that we did the survey was when we were really cutting things. So I think people then were, were thinking more in terms of you know um, what they wanted to make sure we focused on. And now that things are, are a little bit better, people are starting to say, well, this is important too, and this is important too. So. As far as um, <clears throat> the what level of importance in cross tabulations, you'll see that with and without children, both say high quality staff and curriculum are the most important, but then the third item varies a little bit. With people with children saying extracurriculars are the most, the third, ranked third, and uh, people without children say social, emotional, and health support. 
But those are related, aren't they? I mean, yeah. really, I, I mean, yeah. through the extracurriculars, we can assume that we're getting social, emotional, and, and health support. Right. Um, sources of information, it's funny because even with all this focus on technology and the internet and social media, the print tools are still the, the primary sources of information for most members of the public with the district newsletter and the community news being the top. Um, although we are seeing um, growth in the website, growth in Facebook, if you see Facebook really has gone up a lot, and we're starting to see growth in Twitter as well. And then what's interesting about the cross tabulations, if you notice among the no voters and among the people without children, while the first, all of them, the newsletter is the most important, but then the next two are not district communication tools. Um, so like among the yes voters and people with children, you've got the district website, parent portal, that kind of thing. But when you, um, we, we start to lose them in the other district communication tools when they don't have children. Well, it would have been problematic if we had people with children <laughs> and yeah. we don't use our <laughs> communication tools. Yeah, so, that's true. So I guess that's a consistent Although thing. I have to say what's really funny, because I, I do the cross tabs, a number of people without children said they get their information from the parent portal. <laughs> so. but th th another point, folks, have to move off this. One of the things that we are seeing now I'm not going to say rich newspaper, but we know that they're literally going to the website, pulling information off the website, dropping it into a newspaper article. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so I share that because those things are becoming interchangeable. News, we don't have newspaper other than Glenn mm -hmm. that comes to our board meetings, but yet you read articles all the time about the school district. They're grabbing things off the website, be it budget it's, or otherwise. It's all the media. Even yeah. today I, I posted a bunch of stuff on Twitter um, and I had all these emails from different media stations saying, can I get the contact information for this person, that kind of thing. So I'm not even really doing press releases anymore. Most of them are just getting the information off the website or off the uh, Facebook and Twitter because they all follow us. As far as do you think the district's communications provide you with good sound information? The majority said yes. Um, among no voters, the majority said sometimes, um, but, but a good portion of them, 28% said yes as well. And as far as the demographics, um, the majority live in Clifton Park or between the ages 31 and 50, have children in Shenandoah schools, although you have to, while this is the majority, 51%, keep in mind that means 49% don't have kids in uh, Shen schools, at least those who filled out the survey, um, and they're not employed by the district. Mm -hmm. And then this um, survey every year, or we post it on the website too, so the general public can see it in, in its entirety. Any questions? No, I think it's just important that we continue to do this. It's, it's we try to get feedback every way, and then we go out and test the effectiveness, and and we take the information and we adjust. And that's why we we keep it pretty much similar every year. Every now and then we change, like we added the tax levy thing and um, question and that kind of thing, but it gives us comparative data um, to have it be relatively the same every year. So, Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The second, any other question from the board related to the budget survey? You don't want to disregard that. Um, the second presentation we have tonight is the Orenda um, um, local assistance plan. We presented at the beginning the plan. Mm -hmm. um, tonight, Mr. Smith, along with Mrs. Strangis, who was awarded tenure tonight, no pressure on her, um, <laughs> uh, here to provide an update in terms of what progress we have made so far and what do we have planned for the coming year um, as well. So, Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, again, thank you to the board for having this opportunity. Uh, for those who remember my last presentation, I kind of choked to death up here, and I promise not to try not to do that again. Um, first, I want to I want to thank um, the teachers and the staff in, the, in Arenda who really rolled up their sleeves this year and uh, made a commitment to try to make some changes and uh, try to work with a population that we continue to 
um, try to serve and support, and um, I think they really did a great effort this year. I also, even though she now has tenure, I do want to thank my partner. Mm -hmm. Kathleen was a true partner in this process with us in terms of really uh, working with, particularly on a few areas, but really focusing our energy and effort and uh, bringing a lot of skill and helping with our, with our data analysis and our, uh, and our reading programs. And so I really want to thank, you know, thank her, even though she now has tenure, she doesn't need my thank yous, but I really want to publicly thank her because mm -hmm. I, I, I tell you that we would not have been as successful as we were without her help, so thank you. Um, again, the first slides really talk about there's um, the school accountability designation, which is coming out, I think, Mr. Amelia, probably at the end of this it's month. Awesome. Yeah. So um, every year they make those designations, and there's, besides the overall designation for the school, there's four subgroups that if you have 30 or more students, in a subgroup. In, in Arenda, uh, we have that in the, usually in that in the special education population and we have it with the economically disadvantaged population. And so uh, each year that group also has to make adequate yearly progress in order as, by, as defined by New York State. In 2012-2013, Arenda, uh, economically disadvantaged population, as compared to its the performance of the whole school, there was a wider gap that existed, and so we were required to write a local assistance plan. And as I, as I came to learn, as we went to some training this year, this was actually the first year of local assistance plans. And in the future, they're going to be, it's going to be based on two years' worth of performance instead of one year's worth of performance. But uh, when they started this year, it was based on just one year's performance. Uh, that plan that we had to create looked at uh, school leadership practice and decision make decisions, curriculum development and support, teacher practices. Uh, student social and economic developmental health, and uh, family and community engagement. And so uh, we looked, one of the things we did, they wanted us to look beyond the state data, state testing data. So we spent a lot of time looking at our student data, both for last, previous years, as and we also looked at the data this year in an effort to try to make those changes and create an action plan uh, of some things that we need to, we wanted to focus our attention and energies on. Um, and I'll give a shout out to Dr. Wood who um, helped kind of put this graphic in, into place. I think you remember it from the, from the first time, which was uh, really talked about the four areas of our focus. Um, the plan that the state required was much bigger, but we really narrowed it down. And, and, and this really helped us focus our, our attention and energy. One is consistent implementation of the Journeys program, which was, uh, which was a goal for all the schools, but I think we did because it was a focus of our lap plan, we did a particularly good job in Arenda in making sure that our teachers really understood and implemented that. Second was focus on small group instruction. I, I, told, I, was tell, I did this presentation to the faculty the other day and I could say with all the classrooms when I went in, almost without any exception, and some of them were already doing an excellent job, that our teachers focused on, their focus on group instruct, small group instruction in their ELA process became stronger uh, in every instance. So I really think that was a significant strength of our program. Third was our academic intervention supports, making sure that the students who needed extra help were getting the help they needed, making sure that we knew who they were, making sure that we were targeting the needs, making sure as we try to begin to really specifically in the area of literacy, begin to identify specifically where their need was and give them the uh, type of instruction that required to make that growth. And the last area, which is always my, was, was my favorite when we started and it still is because it really uh, brought a lot of extra energy into the building, was a focus on, school-wide focus on grit. And uh, not only grit, but the growth, also looking at the growth model as, as a partner in that grit process. And uh, our school really embraced it to the point where, you know, and I will be talking about this later, but it really, really embraced the idea from students who can articulate it at the, at the very, at the first grade level and the kindergarten level all the way up to our fifth graders who were, who I saw good examples in the state testing process of students who had never, who had given up in the past, who really focused their energy and efforts. I'm going to let Kathleen jump on to the next. Error. Good job. <laughs> While that gets rebooted, I can just tell you a funny story about that grit piece. 
So I happened to be in a classroom, uh, first grade classroom, my favorite little cherubs, and um, there are learning stations going on. And there is one station being assisted by a uh, parent, and it's about word work. And so the little people sort of had to decide with these word parts how to put this together, and it was on a large board. And so the parent turned to the little fellow and said, now what will you have to do to put these words together? And so I'm ready to record. This has got to be a monumental answer, right? The little person says, I need to have grit. I thought, I had no idea that was coming out of their mouth. No idea now. But of course, I ran back in and said, it's there. It's there. So um, I'm going to just walk through a few of these slides. Uh, as uh, Mike said, it was sort of a focus as what we were doing in district in terms of best practices, and then how do we hone in even a little further in Arenda in that way. So we did training on the journey series. All of the Arenda teachers att attended our elementary summits in the beginning of the year. And then as well, we dedicated our literacy coach to one day a week in Arenda. Teachers were able to reach out to her. She was able to do walkthroughs, model lessons, coaching conversations, and then individual professional development workshops. So that offered many, many teachers. You see some took advantage there uh, as often as five times and then some. And that's, that's, that's a reflective process. That's a testament to, OK, it's time to open our doors. Um, Mike was always kind to sort of set that mindset in terms of this is a growth process for all of us. We're all here to learn. So I appreciated that. We had training on eDoctrina. So that's an assessment tool, a sort of uh, warehouse of assessments, item analysis, different kinds of assessments that we can build in there. And we looked at our mid-year common assessment, which we administered for the first time. It was a journey's mid-year checkpoint. And you can see there the fourth grade scoring 97%, scoring 65% or, or better, and then the fifth grade scoring 93% um, or better. The next slide is just sort of, we always talk about data and what does it look like when we dive into it. Um, and often, I think we've even said here, data often leads to more questions than it does necessarily answers, which is the best part of this process. It's still part of that reflective piece. When we have teachers reflecting on practice, we know good things come from that in terms of change because we're there to support each other. Having said that, we were able to drill down right to the question. And here you see just one example. So we drilled to the question. We see how the school responded to the question. We see how the district responded to that question. And then we can also look at not only the correct answers, but the ones that were chosen that perhaps could be distractors. And then what can we learn from that for instruction going forward? We, did, we took that information right to the small group piece. We thought the biggest bang for our buck would be small group instruction, because there I get to see each little person directly to see what their strengths and weaknesses might be. So we did an in-depth review of New York State assessment data when we had multiple years in that way. We worked with fourth and fifth grade teachers, <coughs> pulling them out into full day sessions. Um, we set the stage in any way we could, and of course, we offered a little food too. But they were just so good in that their mindset was, how do we unpack this? And so they began bringing their own assessment data from their classrooms to this, so that we were triangulating pieces. We were looking for patterns and trends. We took that information and said, OK, in terms of pedagogy, what will this mean for us? So Mike and I did a, um, we led a professional book group around um, the Literacy Teacher's Playbook. Sort of a very informal read, um, many analogies to coaching, if you will. And that grit piece came in in that will. But so many of the teachers were already offering best practices. How do we improve on that? And, and just to sort of sum that piece up, the part that I think I walked away most valuable or understanding to be most valuable was not necessarily the product, although there were great products shared. It was the process piece. It led to collaboration. So shortly thereafter, even at faculty meetings, they started to take a change where we were questioning each other and we were having vertical conversations. So it wasn't just what about our grade level, but what is fifth doing and then what is sixth expecting, what's third doing to get to fifth, to get to fourth rather. So a, a great piece there was offered. This next picture was just an activity that we did during that uh, full day workshop. It was called a, a data carousel. We literally lined the walls of the sill with data from every instrument we have. We pulled from our SIS, we pulled from eDoctrina, we pulled from classroom assessments, and we just asked the question, okay, what does this show you? And teachers were able to really walk around and they crisscrossed information, but on this wall I saw this, but on this wall I saw an achievement gap, on this wall I saw, and so the conversations were amazing. And from there, we took that information back into the book groups. 
And um, Mike refuses to pose for the picture, but I was able to sneak in a picture in the back as we were hunkering down in the afternoon. Uh, I'm a little old fashioned and I still like those large post-it pads that you draw on. The webs, the conversation, things to get recorded, and now we just take pictures of them with our phones so we have them. It's amazing how far we've come. But the teachers like revisiting. They, they like knowing that this isn't a one stop and done kind of thing. And so for that I have to uh, praise Mike for continuing that process throughout the year. You had one more kid, Danis. Papa, oh, that's all right. We we'll go one more. I think this is DataMate, which is the um, program that we started using this year to really look at the, uh, really break down the state, um, state data information, and it really had so many different views that the teachers could look at it from, and I think it really helped them hone on some areas for each of them, particularly where they could focus some energy and effort. And so it was a great opportunity to take that information and sit down in a group and kind of talk it through because sometimes, I, I, you know, looking at data by yourself can be kind of lonely, but working in, it, in a group, it really was a valuable process. So these are some of the, um, some of the changing practices that happened. That uh, stop and jot uh, is something that, again, we, we realize that our teachers use a different variety of different terminologies for the same thing, but uh, practice of stopping, writing, having our kids write down what they're seeing, and then, uh, and while students are reading, they're, they're writing, they're jotting, they're taking notes, and they're coming back to it later, and they're having discussions. Small group instruction taking place in every class, and we talked about that. Uh, again, trying to trying to use the data to to drive our instruction. Reading logs became a very popular thing that teachers started doing more of, of keeping track of exactly what students are reading and how they're reading it. We had programs like uh, Raz Kids that's, a, uh, that's on our um, iPads that helps teachers with that to see where, how much students are reading, what they're reading, and it actually gives them some analysis of, of, of their reading. So it's a powerful tool to help teachers in this process. The next area that we were focusing on was the uh, academic intervention services and data review. Uh, again, looking at our students who were who, who required additional support and assistance. The first thing was to uh, is to review and revise the AIA support. So we looked at our our services and our support models and making sure that we were delivering them in the way that was uh, intended. We used that we used our IST process to review students who were not making the growth necessary. Teachers can bring students to the, through that process and say, even though he's getting AIS services, we're not seeing growth. So we had the opportunity to sit and discuss. And really, the IST process is really a, a brainstorming, problem-solving process where you, the people around the table try to figure out with what other strategies could we use, what other approach could we use that would make a difference for those students. So very important. We use the data, we, we have quarterly data and we made sure we made good use of that quarterly data to show if our students were making progress as a whole and individually as student, student by student, were they making the progress required. Next we increased uh, access for parents to, the, uh, to academic intervention services including we supported, uh, did some training for tutors, we're going to do more training for parents. We, uh, including increasing their access to the technology like uh, Think Central and RAS Kids. Sometimes at Cheryl's Lodge they had to come and access it over there because they don't have the technology. We've thought about if we could just have a whole satellite satellite for the entire uh, Half Moon Heights uh, because I think some of them have the techno have the, the hardware but they don't have the internet. So uh, often it's coming to Cheryl's Lodge to get that support. And then the other thing that we, tr um, two of our teachers did this year, which was wonderful, was a preschool story hour at Cheryl's Lodge. Again, trying to encourage the parents to come with their younger children to begin that reading process. Uh, and one thing that we've, every year we've focused some tentry on, on trying to help our uh, faculty focus and understand on working with students from poverty. This year we've, we read an article about the stress level of a, the average stress level of a student coming from poverty and how significant that is compared to most of our population. And I think that really made an impact on our teachers to realize how much stress these kids are bringing into school on a daily basis and how that impacts their learning process. So it really was an eye-opening um, discussion in our fac one faculty meeting. 
we constantly, again, this is looking at the data. This is just one example, again, of data that we look at. Um, just looking at our, pro our students, are they, in this case, we're looking at are they moving to more restrictive support or, or are they going to less restrictive support? This, this is chart is a little deceiving because it's first quarter against third quarter. Usually our fourth quarter data, which is taking place right now, is where we really see kids, a lot of kids being dismissed from uh, the level of service that they're receiving now, so being dropped down to a, le a lower level of service or being dismissed from the service altogether. And again, this is just one. This is another indicator that we put in here, which was that uh, we just had. We do for the middle school. We did some SRI scores. That's how they decide. How that's how they determine who's going to be in which reading groups. And we came to realize that uh, 104 out of our 111 students were scoring within the grade level band. So that was a good indicator of success. Some of the success that we're making this year. Last but not least is our uh, focus on grit. Again, we reviewed the research. We started with that with informing our teachers, helping them understand the concepts of grit and growth mindset, going through the articles and discussing that. And, I th and, and a lot of them really took it uh, and ran with it. Uh, we de developed school-wide programs. We did a school-wide assembly on grit and growth mindset. And I want to you know, particularly give a shout out to our school psychologist, Kristen Fail, and our school counselor, uh, Courtney Swisher, who did a tremendous job on putting a lot of this together. Uh, we came up with a school-wide poster contest, which we had more posters for this contest than we've ever had for any other. And so our school was just covered with, with posters on grit. And uh, Mrs. Swisher did some great uh, bulletin boards that helped emphasize uh, the grit process, including there's one a new one that just went up a couple weeks ago that I think is tremendous. Uh, last. And last is provide presentations to the classrooms. They went in and did actual presentations on grit to the classrooms uh, for fourth and fifth graders this year. And we're hoping next year one of our goals is to move that down to even younger grades. Uh, and then um, most importantly, we identified students who seemed to lack grit. And so we gave them what we call grit groups. And I will just, again, this is where I saw some of those students who participated in grit groups. And I can't say that their overall test performance, I, I, don't, I don't want to promise you that it, it was better, but they completed, I could see very clearly that they completed more of the test than they had in the past. And that was one of my, con <clears throat> do they really not know the information or they're just not taking the test? And for some of these students, they really completed more of the test than they had in the past. And that itself is an accomplishment. Um, these are just some of the things, you know, again, the things that we use, this, this is kind of just shows you all the different aspects of our block, diff, the different blocks. We Professional development, building promotions, assemblies, classroom presentations, parent information, uh, and teacher initiatives. This is just some more pictures of, uh, these are some of our bulletin boards that we're up all, promoting the program. And watching a student stop and read them just it reinforced that they was getting the message across. These are some of the wonderful posters that we that are some of our students, including some of the winning posters in the grit uh, in our grit posters. And we had a grit party afterwards, and I was asking students about again doing a little assessment, informal assessment, asking them what they knew about, and it was amazing what it was coming out of the mouth of some of our younger youngest students in terms of what they already could explain in terms of the growth growth mindset and and grit. This is something that our, one of our fifth grade teachers did, uh, Robin Jess, and it's, uh, I just loved it. She had it up in her classroom that each one of her kids became like a superhero for grit, and uh, each of them had, gave a, a, lot, a practical example of how they were going to show grit in their lives. So it was just something, again, not something that we planned for them, but they planned for, that teacher took it, took the idea, used the technology, and made it something special. So. Dr. Robinson said, you know, again, this was not just about this year, but it's what are we going to do in the future to make sure that this is, because as I said to the faculty, whether we continue to maintain a LAP designation, which I'm, I'm confident that we won't, we still will continue to struggle with our economically disadvantaged population to ensure that they're finding success in school. That is a challenging population to uh, get excited every day in and day out to just get them to school sometimes is a challenge. 
and so we need to continue to work on this whether the state says we have to or not we know we have to continue so we were going to continue to uh, update our action plan uh, including setting tar targets for next year for student outcomes uh, our teachers are very excited to you know Kathleen talked about the e doctrina and um, we're already talking about ways that they can get more access to that data including preloading a lot of the, t the chapter tests from both journeys and the math series so that they can have that data quickly and rapidly uh, so that they can have that analysis because they really are buying into that but they want it quickly and they want it from the test from what they're teaching and that has that impact you know when they get the analysis of the state testing that happened last year it's not as powerful as they got the test that they get the analysis of the test they just did yesterday and that's what eDoctrina e has the ability to give us. Um, again, quarterly view of uh, the, you know, again, looking at the da data for IST and the I IST team, collaborative and collegial sharing of best practices. Again, having faculty sharing what's working in their classrooms. And, uh, you know, I, we still struggle with our, our staff does, and Kathleen brought this up at our last faculty meeting. Our staff does some amazing things in the classroom, but some of them are still not willing to share that out with all their colleagues. And so we're just continuing to work on that process about how they can, you know, pat themselves on the back and not be afraid to seem as boasting or bragful if they if they are sharing a great practice that they're doing in the classroom. They're they're humble that way, I guess. And uh, again, continue to find uh, training dates and meetings for our parents at Cheryl's Lodge. We have a we are blessed to have a place like Cheryl's Lodge that serves our needy, you know, so many of our neediest population, and we have to continue to look at how we uh, use that ser supports and services and continue to try to find better ways uh, to get through to those families so that we can support their children. Okay. Thank you. How about, how about questions and comments? Gary? Uh, a couple of them. <clears throat> First of all, I really like how you've identified where the problems are, where it's bringing the resources to it and then determining whether your, your level of success and redesigning based on the, it's, that's the best model, not just to address a deficiency, that bad, maybe bad choice of words, but you know mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Uh, but for all of our schools, because it's the most effective way to apply the, the resources that you have to the students' needs. But uh, there was one specific question here, I got, I got some others. Yes. Uh, it was, it looked like basically it's an item analysis and they, uh, they identified the common core area that the question was oriented to. They actually give you the questions themselves. I understand there was an issue with disclosure of questions from the tests. These questions here are from our mid-year common assessment that we have in-house, so it's not the New York State assessment. Oh, okay. So you have those. Right. But we okay. do use the New York State common, ass the, the common assessments. Right. Uh, they released last year almost 50% of those. Mm -hmm. We hope that they'll continue to do that. Um, those have been an invaluable resource as we work with teachers to really understand the increased rigor and what the state is expecting. So those also have been very helpful. That's what you can pinpoint. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, I know the, the original statement you know, relative to uh, why we're doing this, essentially, uh, talked about the, uh, an achievement gap, but it also talked about annual growth. And I'm saying to myself, okay, I understand achievement gap, but if you have an effective remedial program, whatever you want to call it, you're not just going to raise the scores of those people who have been identified as in need of assistance, but everybody else. Simply for one reason, you're, everybody else should benefit, but also that group that you're working with, by virtue of doing better, are going to raise everybody else's the average score. So when, when they look at this and they determine whether you've closed the gap, are they also looking at the progress because to me perhaps for those reasons I mentioned the gap will remain to a certain extent but on the other hand the level of performance is up to to closer to what it should be and also that there is real growth so, so Kathleen, what happens there yeah, Kathleen and I had a chance to go to a um, training in Troy uh, when they went uh, in one of the state 
people, uh, one of the assistant commissioners got to speak about how they determine this. And it, it still uh, wasn't always completely clear exactly how they would or wouldn't, but there was a series of indicators. And based the way that he explained it, because the data already existed, this is t actually two years ago's data that they were using, and that we already know what our next year's data is that they're going to be measuring against. Um, I think the growth is there, you know, uh, based that it's that uh, enough of a shift and change. So, but I can't. They're going to have to make that call. But it, I just looking at the data myself, I could see that there was. Uh, but I agree with you from the perspective that not only these kids benefited from uh, some of our efforts, but all of our students benefited from these efforts because these were mostly good practices, and that's why things like the implementation of the Journey series is going to help all of our students, and that's why it was an, needed to be an integral part of this this program I think it was we were very fortunate that the first year of implementation of a new a whole new ELA series that's aligned to the standards was could be part of our plan because I mean probably any other school district that would be the first thing you'd want to do if, if you if you didn't have you didn't know anything and you wanted to put one first thing in place that's what you would have done we were just fortunate that that lined up perfectly for us so we were very blessed and blessed to have Kathleen and uh, and a, such a program because I think that will alone will is going to see we're going to see progress. Other comments? I, I did want to say as uh, a member of the partnership team over there, who probably misses more meetings than I should, but uh, and and attending events there, I think you missed a word, and the word is heart. Um, the staff, the, what we go through all this, and we and we collect the data we do it. if if we don't have the if the heart's not there to want to do this to want to work on that and I, and I saw a lot of sharing sharing of I'm I'm doing this over at uh, Cheryl's Lodge or are you thinking about this or it, that that our staff is just so committed and I know the aides as well because that's all it, it's it's not just the teaching force they're they're the front lines on this but I just I see such commitment on this and whether you're under um, a need to have an LAP or not, an action plan, the, the actions that people are talking about start with a commitment from the heart, that they, that they love these students, they know them by name, and you sit there in the meetings, I just sit back and watch them as they go back and forth, and, and they identify someone who's got a special problem going on, and a, a family problem, an issue, and it's not only just having heart and really wanting to, to succeed, but they're taking actions and they're thinking outside the box. The, the backpack program, all those kinds of things. Does does having uh, meals on a weekend does that make a difference? You gotta believe it does, right? And and that's that's organic within that school. So I just want to congratulate you and the staff for that. And Mr. Harrington here, I see in the back anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Miss and and Miss Miss Della Rosa also. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see her. She was she she hiding back there. She yes, was. She dig deep into. She was digging deep into the data with us in the fourth and fifth grade team. So, yep. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. Other than I think that's consent. it for information items. We'll move on to consent items. We have uh, provided to us uh, on Friday the treasurer's report. Kind of a motion to accept the treasurer's report. Well, Jim, are you going to do it? No. You can. No, no, what did I miss? No, no. no I'm <laughs> taking notes for Vanessa. So I just want to make sure. Oh, okay. So, Jim, second. Janet, all those in favor? Motion's approved. We have minutes from the May 12th meeting and the May 26th meeting. Can I have a motion to accept those? Gary, second. Jim, any questions or comments? All those in favor? Uh, action items. Mrs. Mylot is here. Right. Picking up the back here. Limping from some knee replacement or something? Yes, Mr. Yes, Gilbert sorry. and I got a discount, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> Way to maximize the resource. Yes. <laughs> um, I have recommendations from the preschool and the school age committee for 1415 and 1516. Uh, there was a question, too, and I wanted to make sure that, sure, that uh, you received a response on the question. Okay. Could we have a motion? Janet? Second? Mary? Any questions? Any other questions? All those in favor? Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle. Good luck on your recovery. Thank you. Personnel, welcome yes. back. Welcome. Thank you. Um, tonight, I'd like 
um, the board to accept um, the retirement and recognition of two folks who've been in the district, Mr. Jeffrey Gage, a senior automotive repairer who's retiring after 20 years. He's actually, he retired as of May 27th. Um, and Diane Newman, a bus port attendant who's retiring after 12 years of service. In addition, um, we have a lot of uh, new staff that is starting to be brought on board, and I would like to um, recognize um, our recommendation for um, class assistant principal, um, recommended by Mr. Don Flint to join his team at the high school, and that's Laura Tarlow, who was a business teacher, still is a business teacher at heart, but is now joining the administrative team um, at Schlendahoa. Can I have a motion to accept the uh, recommendations on staffing? Mary, second. Jim, any questions? Um, I just yeah. want to make a comment. I, I had mentioned it earlier um, in, in our executive session. and um, Although I think that she probably will make a phenomenal um, assistant Cat principal, whatever, yeah. um, I think the greatest loss is that she won't be in a classroom. But I'm hoping that she will reach more kids um, in her new role because I think Laura Tarlow is one of the finest teachers in this mm -hmm. district and I couldn't be happier to have her in a position where she'll be touching more lives. I think she's back there listening. Oh, she is. <laughs> so I will reluctantly approve it, but okay. I think that she'll do good things moving forward. Great. All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank, Thank you, you, Jill. She's promised to continue the financial literacy training for us. <laughs> awesome. For board members? <laughs> Kathy, we have a lot under business affairs tonight, right? Mm -hmm. So we start with bids on a bunch of supplies, uh, ice cream, bread and, bread and rolls, dairy. Uh, can we have a motion on those bids? Janet, second, Jim. Any questions, comments? All those in favor? Um, budget reappropriation. Kathy, do you just want to say anything about that uh, tax certiorari? There were just some minor settlements that we had uh, set aside some money for in our uh, reserve. <coughs> so we're just reappropriating budget for settlement of those throughout the year. Can I have a motion? I don't think I asked for a motion. Mary, second, Janet. All those in favor? Mary, no. Janet. Janet. Uh, we have a change order. Actually, this is the kind of change order. Kathy brings a lot of those to us. A minus change order. We're getting a credit of six hundred and seventeen dollars from Harold Plune. Uh, can I have a motion? Gary, <laughs> second, Jim. You're getting these? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? We never turn money down. The number next. Yeah. <laughs> um, disposal of obsolete equipment and and uh, number five and oh I missed one number Didn't four right one. contract yeah. renewal Th uh, third party administrator for self funded workers comp. We have a motion, Janet, second. Jim, questions? All those in favor? Approved. <laughs> um, can we combine five and six, disposal of obsolete things with receiving donations of freezers? And, <laughs> yeah. and it's going, it's coming, <laughs> that's it. We have a motion, sure. Janet, second. Mary, all those in favor? With gratitude. There with we go. Yes, with gratitude. And what's this equity transfer of $198.94? <laughs> I was looking yeah. for a big number there. You have a big one next time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. 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 Close. Yeah. Can I have a motion? Jim? Second? Janet? All those in favor? Approved. Uh, scholarship and local grant donations. Um, wonderful thing. Uh, can we have someone recommending that we approve that? Janet? Mary? All those in favor? Can I, can I just say? Yes, you can. I just really appreciate the support of the community in the tiny little box tops or Hannaford Helps or whatever mm -hmm. it is. It, all those little things add up add and up. that they dedicate those proceeds to our school district is a wonderful thing. Yes, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, you Re can. Re relative to the equity transfer, is I'm assuming that the board had to act on it because it was required by law. Yes. Yeah. Is it possible? I mean, sometimes we have pre-authorization for doing certain things as long as they've involved less than say 500 or a thousand dollars can that be done I mean to bring I would say that this is one of those that the board want to do because when, when we approve the budget we do budget transfers without bringing those to the board and there's a dual signature on the budget transfers but for these type things where we're going to it from another fund it's just, I think it's just good practice. While mm -hmm. today's pennies, it could be millions of dollars tomorrow. 
right. and we don't want to, to commingle funds without this authorization. So I mean, so I would suggest that we keep it that way. Yeah. All those in favor? <laughs> Approved. Um, service agreement with Johnson Controls. We're familiar with them. They manage and, and maintain our uh, controls around the district, and they have for a long time, right? And a lot of yes. this is proprietary equipment. Correct. Do we have a motion to accept that? Jim, second. Gary, I saw your hand moving. Um, <laughs> any, any questions? I saw you blink. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> All those in favor? The auction. <laughs> Dr. Building Strange condition lost. survey, that's a requirement that we yeah. do every five years, yeah. right? Okay. Mosaic Associates are the firm that does most of our architectural engineering support. Uh, can we have a motion? Janet, second. Jim, all those in favor? Thank you. And then 11 and 12, we have a contract uh, for a hot water heater at uh, Skinner de Sago, and we have emergency replacement of one at uh, Carragon Arenda. It says something about the need to do this survey and, yeah. and start thinking about long term here. Uh, can I have a motion to accept 11 and 12? Janet, second. Jim? Questions. All those in, yes. Do we have to go through the whole state approval process again? Yes. Yeah. Unbelievable. Sorry. <laughs> unless, it's, unless it's absolutely. <laughs> right? I yeah, mean, the exception yeah. would be if something that's going to shut down a building. Obviously, sure. we'll, we'll address it and deal with the paperwork after the So factor. unfortunate. Yeah. Two identical footprints can't get a rubber stamp. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. All those in favor? Yep. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, approval of 2015-16 uh, uh, meeting dates, as Oliver pointed out, if uh, we need to change those as uh, on the fly or weather or whatever, we can do that. But it's uh, helpful for the planning of the district that we have uh, these uh, meeting dates laid out early. Uh, can I have a motion <laughs> to accept? Janet, second. You yeah, wait a minute. You're motion. not even going to be here. Yeah. Jim, Jim right. is seconding. <laughs> Any quite, all those in favor? <laughs> She says there's not enough meetings there. I want you to <laughs> add yeah, really, I think you should have more of them. Them. somebody else's. <laughs> more often, every week, will you? Every week. <laughs> and Mrs. Carmen, you're back for second reading. That, uh, up for the first time tonight. We have um, <coughs> four policies going for um, second reading tonight for approval. The board has had those. Do we have any questions? The policy committees reviewed them. Can I have a motion to accept them? Mary, <laughs> for the policy committee. Jim, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Uh, there's an opportunity for additional public comment. Anybody? I don't know if we've got any public left at this point. Um, I will call out uh, before we adjourn that um, our next meeting is on uh, June 23rd. It will be Mrs. Gray's last meeting. Um, and then our reorganizational meeting will be July 7th. Graduation is on the 25th at 1.30 in the afternoon, as I recall, something like that, right? And we have uh, tickets here for you. With that said, can we have a motion for adjournment? Jim, second. Janet, all those in favor? Meeting's adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.